accidentally I caught this movie accidentally the first time I watched it. It was I think it was like on in the background or something when I was at my dad's house and uh and and the little bit I caught I was like okay, I have to watch this movie, mostly because my dad called it Rat Patootie. <laughs> uh but then oh, I went and watched it. Oh god. Um probably it's probably been like 10 years, I would say. No oh, man. Um maybe 12. I, I just recently rewatched it. Um, I the first time I saw it, it was only a couple years old at the time, so there was a lot of stuff in there that I totally forgot about. Um, as, right as it happens, you know, when you've seen a movie and then you wait like fifteen years. <laughs> yeah, well, I loved it. Like when I finally watched it, I loved it. It was, uh, um, you know, I mean, kind of. This is around around where I like to talk about kind of the my general feeling on the movie whether it was you know like the technical aspects of it and i mean of course it's disney and pixar the animation is uh, uh, immaculate <laughs> as they do as they do um <clears throat> the way that they do their music and stuff like that is is i mean it's always just perfect uh but really what drives this one i think is really is the story um, and a little bit the humor <laughs> basic movie info on this one is is that it's a Disney and Pixar production uh, released in 2007 it was directed by Brad Bird and Jan Pinkova I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name I don't either yeah um, but it stars Brad Garrett Lou Romano uh, Patton Oswalt which I I, I don't heard, know I why know he's he the third one movie. yeah the well he's Remy like, I don't oh know God. why he's the last name <laughs> on the poster names, because it's like, no, this is this is a huge story about about Remy. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess they they put those in. However, I, I guess they want to, I suppose. Um, now, the IMDb description usually is not great. This one I don't feel like is too bad. I mean, it's it's a very basic description. It's not really something that grabs you too much, but. A rat who can cook makes an unusual alliance with a young kitchen worker at a famous Paris restaurant. So tell me, tell me what it is that, that, how did you feel about the movie the first time you watched it? Like, I mean, cause you, I know that about the time that this came out, you would have already been into your career as, as a cook. Uh, and I think you probably would have been on your way to, uh, onto being a chef. Yeah, so the the first time I watched it, the movie came out in 2007, and like I said, it was a couple years after that, so I had only been cooking at the time, because I started around early 2008, and then I saw the movie in 2010. I was a line cook at the time, working mm -hmm. uh, working at a family restaurant, and you know, that's, that's there's a lot of microwave stuff, and, and it's, not, it's not the most prestigious, it's like short order stuff, um, but watching that and seeing the you know the way that they were able to capture kind of the bustling of the kitchen and the fact that they didn't really show a lot of the actual um cooking like there there were scenes when it was relevant but there was no like overt like showing a rush or anything like that and right. it was more about the stories of the characters and i thought it was a really awesome concept with with you know the whole concept of anyone can cook and then having having a rat in there and then you know some of the scenes where like linguini wanted to say something but he knows that it's nuts he knows that it's right. crazy that they won't accept it and i i don't know my general impression of it was it, it is a really good feel good movie and there it had some it had some elements in there that that are kind of i don't want to say dark but really deep really heavy that they were willing right. to put in there. And that's something you don't really see in a lot of uh, kids movies. There were some pretty heavy things in there. Like uh, I almost like I felt like they were putting in some statements. The scene of Remy's dad showing him the rats in the window. And, you know, I, I saw that. And when I, when I watched that and, you know, and he was making a statement to his kid, but that was like, that was pretty, like, if you think about it, pretty graphic, considering the main character is, like, you know, a rat that you're supposed to develop these, like, emotional feelings for, and then right. seeing that. Like, it, his dad is actually coming from a good place. Um, you know, he was raised 
a certain way and learned things a certain way and it's kind of almost a statement on the status quo like this is where this is why we don't trust humans that was essentially the message in seeing that Mm -hmm. all the uh the rat poison and all of that kind of stuff and he was very um he was looking out for his kid he didn't want his kid to end up in that window so even though it seems you know you want to root for remy there's also like it it kind of it kind of explores this risk that he's taking where right if he does this just because he likes to cook he's literally risking his life and i don't know i, I just found that kind of deep it's almost like he's giving up a part of of who he is uh you know, because I mean, a, a normal part of a rat is to is self preservation, safety, um, uh, secrecy. You know that kind of stuff. Staying staying where you're where you're at the least risk. But he he has this dream, like, and I, I feel like it's almost like he's it's a a testament to him wanting to move outside of himself in pursuit of a dream. Um, that he doesn't even know what that dream is, <laughs> you know, like right. he just, he knows there's something that he wants to do. That's more. He just doesn't know what that more is. Um, and so he pursues that, that feeling, not even knowing what it's supposed to be. Uh, and, and I don't know, I think, I think that that's pretty powerful. Um, is the, I mean, despite where he comes from, um, you know, and, and he's risking a lot, not just, not just, safety wise, but also his family, his friends, their judgment says a lot about, you know, I mean, they're every time he, he comes across them, they're like, you know, come on, man, <laughs> like right. we're rats. Like this is ridiculous. Yeah. But he, he risks those relationships to pursue something that he loves, even though he doesn't know what it is. <laughs> so, um, and that can be pretty powerful too. Um, also shows a little bit about how, how sometimes we can be held back by those that that are around us, uh, that right. we keep around us. Good so intentions are not mm -hmm. are not always are not always positive. The first one we meet for like with with any sort of gusto is Gusto, mm -hmm. um, and and we learn we learn about his uh, his philosophy, the way that he does things in the kitchen, uh, and 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 the way he. Um, he develops his food. <laughs> I, actually, I love how we fan theory about Gusto as well. Yeah. I don't know if you've, if you've heard that, uh -uh. Uh, my wife's actually the one that originally told me and I explored it and I, and I was like, you know, there, there's one scene where it's, it's kind of hard to see it, but his concept of saying everyone can, anyone can cook essentially. Yeah. There, it was implied that it's possible that, um, he had a rat under his head too is the way the fan theory goes. And so how Gusto, that's why Gusto developed the whole, like anybody can be a cook, you know, I don't know how true it is, but it is really interesting that it's a, uh, it kind of gives fun. you another take on it. You know, it's like fun. the hair that he pulled out of uh, Gusto's hat, you know, was that Gusto's or was that, or was that a Gusto thing? rat? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, that, that one, that one I can accept a lot more than like, I was I was preparing myself. Anytime there's fan theories brought up, I'm always like bracing myself for that Jar Jar Binks is a Sith Lord thing. And I'm like, <laughs> screw you. Like I'm not I'm not gonna listen to that. But no, I like that one. That one's not so bad. I will um, say, um, on an, on another note, just talking about the Gusto character himself, like one of the things that I noticed is that he actually represents a a type of he's like almost like the archetype of having like genuine passion for what he does and mm -hmm. a true love for it and you could tell like the way that they they show him and demo him even though even though when they show him it's a figment of Remy's imagination right every time they see him he's you know he's about being a good person and making sure everything's the best quality and having like a love for the food and wanting to bring people joy and and all of that Whereas like Skinner is like the exact opposite of that. Yes. Uh, the commercial chef. Right. You know, kind of thing. No, I, I, I can get along with that. Uh, I mean, Gusto, Gusto is, is, I always feel like that Gusto is, is kind of you. Um, it, like that, that 
that there's honor given to the food, you know, that, that there's respect for, for the craft, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you're doing in front of you. Um, that's one of the things that I always really admired about the way that you do your work is, is that, is that there's that respect there. Um, I think that's the difference between somebody, because I'm actually working on a video about uh, pretentious, like cooks that are pretentious. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about them being pretentious people, but doing pretentious things. And there, there's a couple of like really good celebrity chefs who, even if I have respect for them, sometimes they get into a little bit of pretentiousness. <clears throat> Sorry. And one of the things that I, I think is important with that is there's a fine line or there is a line drawn when I think pretentiousness is kind of creating the food without that respect, but still trying to make it fluffy and frilly and, you know, wanting to be right. the best food, but not, not really feeling that passion towards it when you do it, mm -hmm. like basically kind of, um, doing it for, well, essentially doing it for the wrong reason, doing it because you want to impress somebody more so right. than, you know, I just want to make something amazing. You know? Almost, almost like, um, uh, well, Goldschlager. It's an alcohol with gold flakes in it. There's no reason for gold flakes to be in it. It doesn't add anything to the flavor of the food or of, of the drink. It's not, I mean, you can buy gold leaf and add it to anything. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it's nothing. It's, you're you're doing it simply for the prestige of saying that you did it, essentially. Um, yeah, like uh, like putting uh, what is that truffle oil comes in a bottle that big and it's like fifteen bucks or something like that. Putting that and everything and it's cut with olive oil anyway, it's not even a real thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, see, and and your respect for that food. Uh, and, and not just the, not just the food itself, but also the craft, like, um, and, and that was one of the problems that I had with one of the characters, Linguini, um, Linguini was like, so remove, remove the fact that this is a, a, a Disney movie and that we have talking animals and things like that. There's a few moments where he's not talking, where Remy's not talking, but Linguini is talking to Remy. And he's, he's talking to an animal that doesn't talk like, he, like it's a person. And then he discovers that this animal understands him a little bit crazy in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And he's acknowledging that it's crazy like, they, like he would in the real world. But yet he still opts for taking an animal and putting it on his head to puppeteer him to cook over the idea of why don't I just learn how to cook? Like learn your craft, you know? Mm. And, and that, that was another thing that like kind of connected me connect, had me connect you with Gusto was the, was that you just know your craft, you know, your food, you know, the, you know, the flavor profiles, you know how to put things together and, and, when you didn't know, you learned. And Linguini doesn't do that. <laughs> I think I that's a, a huge difference a, between them. Right. I actually had a, a weird takeaway watching the movie the second time. And the takeaway was that Linguini actually represents a type of entitlement that comes with uh, one, of, one of the things that, that I had wanted to touch on, which was the entitlement of somebody that is being born into something. Like, right. you know, a famous actor having a kid and that kid just having access to those things, even if that kid can't act, might be a great right. chef, you know, but can't act, but keeps getting these roles because of his namesake and where he came from. And, you know, there's the, I feel like Linguini kind of embodies a lot of that because he is Gusto's son mm -hmm. or related to him. I'm not, was it son? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. there being a real blood relation, but yes, you know, and yeah, it was his boy side of that association. He's, he's just some rando, you know, and he, yeah. he likes the idea of cooking, but then he kind of gets all of the trappings of being an awesome chef without actually being able to do it himself. Right. And you would think being puppeteered for that long a period of time, you mm -hmm. would develop those skills by watching yourself do it. 
and and we've kind of talked a little bit about it the exploring that not everyone can be great but greatness can come from anywhere um i mean that the, i i like how how that evolved into that over time uh because in in the very beginning of the movie it's just anyone can cook and and so like and yeah well that's great and wonderful and everything i suppose like I think that with enough training, anybody really could cook. Mm. I think I think you could probably teach somebody. Now, having them to have good taste, that's that's the challenge. The version of that saying that I have is that all chefs are cooks, but not all cooks are chefs. And it's kind of that same concept. Like, anybody yes. can cook, but not everybody can be at that level. You right. Know, like, there's a level that I'm... I will be lucky if I ever see it because of what I need to do to get to that level. I don't have the ability or resources for like, I can't go to France and, and cook under the greatest chefs and learn, you know, so there's a skill set that I'm never going to have, or right. I'm not going to get as close as I would be. You know, it would take me three, four times as long to do it. I mean, but, it, but it, it is the same. It is the same concept. You know, not everyone can cook. Not everyone can be great, but they but greatness can come from everywhere, anywhere. Um, you know, every chef is a cook, but not every cook is a chef. Normally, something that that kind of goes on on uh, in in your line of of uh, uh, creation and everything, like your videos usually tend to focus on how how the difference between a chef and a cook is that is that leadership aspect. A lot of the time, I don't think that's something you can teach <laughs> is, is how to be a leader. Um, I mean, I suppose you can, you can learn some tricks and things like that, but, but I think even then leaders who aren't born to lead, I think you can really kind of tell uh, the difference. At least I, I feel like I do, but yeah, no, I really like that. I like how, how you correlated that with something that I've heard you say uh, numerous times before. It almost reminds me of uh, the way that people talk about genetics and bodybuilding where mm -hmm. they say that, you know, anybody can look really good, but if mm -hmm. you don't have that like top tier 1% genetics, even you could, you could take all the roids in the world and you're mm -hmm. still not going to look like, you know, uh, Johnny Shreve or Ronnie Coleman, you know, cause they're just that good. They're, they're genetically gifted and they had all of these other things. So I think that you can teach leadership skills to anybody, but how much they absorb, how they execute that, their personality and a lot of things that they, right. they naturally have may not, uh, may not allow may not come to, as naturally. Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree with that. This is, this is one of the ones that I was really looking forward to getting into. Yeah. The, uh, so women's role in, in a kitchen, mm -hmm. You have marked down uh, Colette's monologue about having to fight for everything uh, in a system designed to keep her uh, kind of in her place. I've actually got a sound bite for that. I'm going to go ahead and play that. No, you listen. I just want you to know exactly who you are dealing with. How many women do you see in this kitchen? Well, I... I <laughs> Only me. Uh, Why do you think that is? Well, I... Because I, how to oh. is an antiquated hierarchy built upon rules written by stupid old men. Rules designed to make it impossible for women to enter this world. But still I'm here. How did this happen? <laughs> because, well, because you, uh, have fun. Because I am the toughest cook in this kitchen. I have worked too hard for too long to get here, and I am not going to jeopardize it for some garbage boy who got lucky. Got it? Oh. Go home! I love that scene. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah, the way that, uh, uh, I mean, she's stabbing those knives through his sleeve, uh, his his coat sleeve, and, and uh, was slowly pinning him to the table. Um... <laughs> and he just doesn't know what to say because he he starts off that conversation trying to be like super cool and and suave. He's all right. like, you know, I just want you to know. And she's like, boom, no, <laughs> like, not happening. First off, I look, I kind of want to I kind of want to ask you, uh, what, what's your opinion on Colette uh, kind of representing women uh, in a kitchen as as a character? Um, because I, I haven't worked in a lot of kitchens but I feel like there's a lot of Colette's in kitchens. Yeah. I'll get, um, I'll get more specifically into like female chefs. Mm -hmm. Um, but Colette actually represents something. I really wish my, my wife was actually here for this part, like that she could weigh in because having that perspective is really, uh, I think important and it's missing in not just this industry, but overall. Mm -hmm. And 
the thing is is that the the way that my wife puts it is they have to be two or three times as hard as any man that's there and mm. they you know aren't always allowed to show emotions they can't admit that they're overwhelmed but women are really treated on this other level where if they do anything they you know they can be seen as emotional or you know they, right. they aren't given the same opportunities or they're given less pay and i think that overall that is absolutely not cool and there's there's a lot of times in the kitchen where uh front of house doesn't treat they they'll look right past the uh female chefs and try to find a male chef and talk to them you know even though somebody might be standing right next to me that's a woman that is completely more qualified than me to answer that right. question and a lot of times when you see these successful women, you will notice that there is this, this, uh, obviously in Colette, it's, you know, slightly exaggerated for, for what the message is, but you will notice there's a lot of women that have that kind of hardness about them because, you know, so many industries are male dominated because they have to. Yeah. And that is very true. Uh, I mean, in a lot of industries, even a lot of the time it's ignored. Uh, but even even in industries that are female dominated, you look at a lot of those industries, but you look at the leadership and it's the leadership is all men. You have, you know, a, a, an industry that is primarily women workers all vying for these upper positions that it's like they're they're fighting so hard to get there just to run into this block that a lot of the time men are are picked for those those positions. So, I mean, in. in it happens all the way from uh, your your saucier to your sous chef to your you know to your chef. But I mean, it it happens in the whole restaurant. <laughs> like I mean, right. how many? Most of the time, when you look at a restaurant, the owner is a man. You know, and and you know he picks his his front of house manager. A lot of the time, it's men. Uh, m most people call it a waiter, not a waitress. <laughs> you know, a maitre d. Uh, all of these things, I. I really, I really do like how, how they really punch it into your face with Colette's attitude. I love it. It is oh, so. I thought that was a really great scene. And, um, you know, I want to add something, something that I always say when any kinds of things like this come up is inevitably you're going to get a comment somewhere, whether it's on your uh, channel or in your uh, comments on podcasts, it's like, well, I'm a female chef owner or whatever. And the way that I say, the way that I see this is, you know, there are literally billions of people on earth. Anything right. that we say, there's always going to be exceptions. There's going to be there's exceptions. There's going to be female business owners or female managers, sous chefs, all of that. And good. I mean, you, you definitely, you definitely see successful, successful women in, in, you know, the kitchen industry. The amount of work that is applied, I think is a lot of the time not equal. I really liked how, how they, they muscled that in a little bit. I don't. I don't know that it was uh, subtle <laughs> at all. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> but I do love. I, mean, if I do kid, love how they put think, it oh, in. Man, she's mad, you know. But, yeah. Um, but it, again, that's another one of those things where it's like that's con that's content that is made for for grownups that is put into a kids movie so that grownups can still get something out of the movie, um, which is why I'm not afraid to have kids movies on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm 40. So, um, but yeah, I, I really did love that part of the, uh, of, of the movie. There was something else in here that is, is this a fan theory or is this something that is, um, is, is this something that there's evidence for you had, uh, ego's mom is the old lady from the beginning. I think it's still a fan theory. I don't think it's like officially stated anywhere in there. Right. But it's, um, to me, it's one that makes a whole ton of sense. Yeah. Just in the simple fact of, like, if you think about the dish that Remy made, that he made ratatouille, and yeah. everybody was like, why are, like, out of, it came out of nowhere. Like, why would you make that dish? That specific dish, and, you know, all of the times that he, you know, he would go in and, he, and she would be watching, um, you know, Gasto's cooking shows and he had her books and things like that. And it seemed to me, it's not a far leap to see that 
he found that recipe in her house. Oh, you know? yeah. Um, it's not verifiable, but I it's one that I I think if you cuz it's really a lot of the fan theory comes from when it that that picture when he takes a bite of the ratatouille and there's that like warping and he's a kid again. Yeah. And a lot of the structures in the house look the same in that scene as when uh you're looking around the house at the opening scenes of Remy. Okay. Doing stuff. Yeah. I'm uh, you know what I think might be might be what seals the deal on that. What's that? Um if I and I'm going to I'm going to rewatch the movie now again <laughs> just because of this. I'm going to look I'm going to look around uh, that old lady's house for a bike. Mm that looks like his bike because that was the whole premise of that scene. He fell off his bike and skid and skinned his knees. Right. So if that bike yeah. is there, that if would that be... bike is there, then you know that that Pixar planned that <laughs> like and anybody listening and watching, if you know more about this, it'd be awesome to get those in the comments as well. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be pretty badass. What about the idea of using your gift to help other people? Initially, my, my thought on, on these two was, uh, that, uh, they they state very plainly i am a human that doesn't know how to cook you're a rat that knows how to cook but doesn't know how to be human mm. so you know initially it comes off as like the symbiotic relationship of of what they do but then later on after he gets schnockered with skinner he's passed out on the floor in the in the kitchen colette comes in and what does Remy do? I'm sitting here going, well, you just leave him on the floor. Like, I mean, there's no reason to, you know, have him have to get up or whatever, but he's trying to, he's trying to help him out. And so he gets him up, you know, pulls up his hair and gets him. So he's standing and all of that. And Colette comes in and he's trying to, trying to play, play it cool. <laughs> while while trying to help, you know, Linguini further his, his, uh, uh, his relationship with Colette, it goes beyond just them being, uh, them being able to mutually benefit each other into, um, they're using, they're using whatever they have as their gift to help the other. Um, you know, uh, yeah, he's a rat. Uh, he's got rat family. When he comes down to it at the end, he brings in his family to help, you know, run the kitchen so that they can get this, uh, so that they can get ego fed, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. What, what, how do how do you view the ability to use your your gifts to help others uh, as it pertains to a kitchen? Well, unfortunately, um, and it's it's been a lot less so um, nowadays. But I was uh, for a long time really jaded in helping anybody after getting right. burned. You know, you get to be almost forty now, and you see something like see somebody on the street there's so many times where you know you've seen people faking it you know there was mm-hmm. actually a family that got caught here where i live that were basically grifting and then they would go out there with their kids help me i need money and they had you know nice cars and everything like that and it was and they got busted for it mm-hmm. and that kind of thing happens so often you know on smaller scales or individual scales that i kind of got to where like i'm going to stay i'm just going to do my thing you know, I'm sorry you need help, but everybody needs help, you know, and and it was kind of a, a negative attitude that I had for a really long time. And then, you know, I started to realize that it's, it's less about, you know, what it comes from being burned. And so then if there's people that genuinely need help, you know, there's no reason why they should have to suffer because of somebody else being an asshole five years ago. So today I'm more... I'm a lot less likely to uh, be a jerk about it. And I think what it's really about, because one of the things that I want to do, I I don't know if it's going to happen anytime in the future, is I actually wanted to use what I know between marketing, soft skills, and cooking ability uh, to basically start a program to help felons uh, develop a skill. And Mm -hmm. whether that is, uh, whether that counts for like, you know, uh, juveniles or actual felons, people that spend 15, 20 years in prison and they just need, they just need some help, you know, especially after witnessing, um, what happened with a close family member, they spent a year in prison and it was only a year 
and it was on mm-hmm. an assault charge. And they, the way the system is set up is almost to bait you into doing something to get you back in there because right. there's like the halfway house. And I think then there's another step down from that before you're, you're kind of like let off. But mm-hmm. having that felony on your record, like there's so many jobs, so many doors shut. And oh, yeah. I think it's really not. And I, I truly believe that there is a lot of people out there that had they just had that one more chance after their screw up, you know, like there's a really close friend of ours that is now a business owner that was looking down, you know, possible 10 years, you know, assault a police officer and a DUI charge and all that. Right. And now they're a business owner. They're very successful. They're They're doing pretty good. And they just needed that one, you know, just that nudge and that bump in that right direction. And I think that using your skills to help others can be not handing out, you know, things that you have, but giving them tools to uh, develop those skills and do things on their own. And it also will show like how badly they want it. Right. That's yeah, that's pretty much where I am on that. That's awesome. Well, and I mean, even, even you yourself, you know, you, you've, uh, uh, I mean, you've, you've grown in, in your, uh, content creation and stuff like that in a way that I, I, I relish (laughs) you do, you do a really great job. And the whole premise of what you do is utilizing your knowledge, your skills, the, the, you know, the skills that you, that you just had and the ones you developed and turning around and, and helping those that don't have, that don't have the knowledge, but have the curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you, you've, that, that I think is, is really something that, that, you know, that you shine at is using your gift to help others. Um, and, and, uh, so good job. (laughs) (laughs) I applaud you for that. I probably had a good 50, 60 videos up that didn't have any more than 10 views, you know, (laughs) right. Sitting at 50 subs for a year and a half until it finally started getting traction. So yeah, you, well, and you blew up, you blew up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working at it. (laughs) So, um, now the, the last point of interest here that I really wanted to talk about, this one was yours. Uh, ego, the critic came from a hum from humble beginnings. Uh, possibly poverty, uh, to being an authority on the best restaurants in France, misunderstood and uh, portrayed as an antagonist. Um, and uh, and it would also be nice to touch on the role of critics. Well, I mean, that, the, the idea that he came from like lower income is the, the way that they have the emphasis on Ratatouille being a quote-unquote peasant's dish, that it yeah. was something that, that the poor eats. Mm-hmm. And him... No, like having that knowledge and understanding, looking back on that and seeing, you know, them him eating that and that was something that brought him more warmth and comfort. It's not a, not a hard leap to say, like, well, he he didn't come from an affluent um, family, you right? Know, simple house, simple dishes, simple life, that kind of thing. And the the part about him now being an authority. There's, it, it's almost like he developed this sense of being jaded at the bastardization of food and mm-hmm. the pretentiousness that I touched on earlier. And his antagonism comes from him wanting to really find that joy again and find something that he could really say is the best. He wants from from what i saw he wants to like the food he wants to mm-hmm. say good things but you know after so many times of you know crappy chefs making crappy food you know there's you start to kind of develop the sense of like well this is never going to happen i'm never going to find you know that, that right that awesome gem oh. Almost you know. like he becomes almost like he becomes hostile about it just because he knows like he's gone through it so many times that he's like, yeah, it's this is just another this is just another pretentious chef with a pretentious dish and trying to impress me. And it's going to be just like everything else. Um, 
you know, like almost, almost like he's, like you said, he's looking for a good meal, but after doing it so many times, he just expects that everybody's going to disappoint him. And that, and that essentially turns him into, uh, a, a, a pessimistic, nasty critic. I don't know if you have a clip of this specifically, but one of the ones that really stood out, which got me thinking of this concept with ego was when he ordered perspective. Oh, I dude. Don't know if you have but he's I don't like, know. you provide the food and I'll provide the perspective. I'll provide the perspective. <laughs> I loved that little, that little exchange there was perfect. Cause I love how the mater D was like, so <laughs> what would you like to eat? Like, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that was, that was really good. And Peter O'Toole's voice for ego. I, I, that's intimidating. Even, even as a cartoon, um, does a really great job. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I love, I love how, how the, the, the critics thing, um, the, the critics, uh, your, your commentary on critic critics is kind of what, uh, is more aligned with, with, uh, my active ingredient in this. And I don't know, I guess I don't really want to, I don't really want to mess with that too much before, uh, before we get into it with yours. But, uh, um, now, now what, what was it that you wanted to, to talk about as far as the role of critics? Well, as far as the role of credits go, there there's some things that, that are exaggerated in the movie, and it's not to knock the movie specifically, but there's a couple things like, for instance, one bad review isn't going to take a Michelin star away. You know, he's not a Michelin inspector, and right. most of the time it is a rolling out of food reviews and customer reviews and kind of a mixture of those over a long period of time that start to bring a restaurant down. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if everybody loves the food and a critic comes out with a bad review, it doesn't kill the restaurant at all. People, right. people are just like, well, that guy probably just had an ax to grind or something like that. It's when it happens multiple over multiple times. Um, you know, mainly the impact, uh, mainly the impact that they have. Now I could see well-known magazines, um, that have like food sections making a good review uh, the one of the restaurants I worked at actually did get a good bump in business because they ended up in one of the top restaurants in the country for mm -hmm. like pizza and burgers and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, it was like they were like ranked like 25 out of 100 or something like that. But still, just having right. having their name on there was was a big bump. People people don't go out of their way to go to a, to a restaurant like that, but they see that name and it's like in marketing they see right. the name it sticks in their head then one day they're making a trip from california to you know wherever to iowa or wherever they're going and they're like hey we're in nebraska there was that one place that we went to that uh that we saw like why don't we go there and check it out you know and that's that's yeah. how you end up getting that increase uh through tourism although but, i do think that there is i i've i've met people that it's almost like their family vacations are destinations to go find places that that are restaurants that people have been on like TV and stuff. Oh, Franklin's is like that in Austin. Yeah, like I mean, there there are people that that that's how they do their family vacations is that they go to they go to famous restaurants that are famous because of being on a show. Um, I mean, there's there have been a couple of times where I've been like, God, I kind of want to make a trip just so that I can try it out, you know? But, um, but I mean, did you even know that was a thing that there's, that there's like a culture of people that they just do destination. I, I don't know what you call that destination dining. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of it, a lot of the people that would come in that, that had that attitude, there, there wasn't as many families, but there was definitely a lot of couples. I mean, I can kind of count anniversaries depending on how far out they're coming, but there's definitely people that they, they go out of their way to come and see the place. A good chunk of it, I'll say comes from people that had a restaurant say since, okay, so I live in Texas. So a restaurant that opened in Houston and then that restaurant, those people 
move somewhere like New York or Arizona or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are some really diehard fans of that restaurant that will now make a trek and drive several states away, whether it's once a year or whatever, just to eat at that place again and, and to see everybody. So I That's think a chunk cool. of it comes from that. And then there is some people that they're just like, you know, I want to visit the restaurant I saw and, uh, you know, diners, drive-ins and dives yeah, you know, stuff like that. Like, That's um, pretty cool. Hell's Kitchen would be another example. Yeah. I, I've, I've actually talked about, you know, how, how I would, I would drive all that way just to go to Hell's Kitchen. If I felt like I could, if I felt like I could justify it, <laughs> like yeah, I want, I want to do that, but I also want to find some other things so that I, I'm not telling people, yeah, I'm driving all the way to, cause it's in California, isn't it? Uh, there's one in California and then I believe they have one in Vegas. The, I think the California one is the one that's actually just open all the time to the public. Right. The other location in LA and the one in Vegas, I think are more like sound stages. And a lot of the people right. that end up there, the reason why they're celebrities is because like, I know a guy that knows a guy and then they kind of come in and eat for free right. as part of the show. But yeah, LA yeah. has the, I believe has the, the restaurant one. That's like the really actual amazing. restaurant. Yeah. 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 See, and I, even that one I'd kill, I'd kill to go to, but I, I feel like I'd have to find another reason to go to LA. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll head out that way for like a YouTube convention or something like that. This, this part of the, this little segment of the show, uh, now that we're starting to get down towards the end of it. Um, this, this is what I call the active ingredient. And it's, it's where we talk about, uh, the overall meaning behind the movie. Um, uh, which that affected you, uh, the, the individual thing that, that really stuck out to you that made a difference in your life that maybe changed your perspective a little bit that was healing for you. Um, do you have, do you have an active ingredient in this movie? Yeah, I, I would say that the, I touched on it in the beginning, but, but the concept of, you know, greatness can come from anywhere. And the whole concept of Remy as the rat having this skill and just needs a way to express it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, relation there with, like, how I feel. And, mm -hmm. you know, the the drive is all about, you know, finding the mixtures. And, and the whole thing could be summed up with the scene of when he ate the piece of cheese and then he ate the, the what I think it was like a strawberry, and then he tried right. it together. And, like, the emotions and passion that he had just for enjoying that and being in the moment and kind of like enjoying the little things mm -hmm. is something that I think is missing from a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny because that, that, um, that little, that little bit that he does with that, I've, I, because of that scene, I have tried doing that. Um, like I find two things that everybody says are things that go really great together. I still don't understand the, um, the, the nuts and cheese thing. I, I still don't get that. Um, but, but I have tried doing that with some, with some of the things like some cheeses and fruits and, and things like that. Um, and I mean, I don't get the sparklies and I don't get the, the colorful wavies and, and stuff like that in the darkness of my eyes or whatever while I've, while I'm doing that with my eyes closed. Um, I would but if I got that. <laughs> right? it'd make, it'd make cooking a whole lot simpler, wouldn't it? Um, but, uh, but instead what it, what doing things like that, uh, kind of reminded me was to just take a, take a moment to appreciate the things that you are doing. Like, you know, when, when you've worked a job that you only get like 10 to 15 minutes for lunch, you, you learn how to work food down mm -hmm. and, and you, it, there is no substance to it. You are simply filling a hole so that you can get back to work. Like, and, and because of that, because of that, you, you 
like it's almost like you lose that ability to really appreciate the things that you're eating. And that can kind of be applied to everything, especially in this day and age where everything is, is instant, <laughs> you know, everything is fast. Everything is, is uh, faster. And so I think it's real easy to, to not appreciate the things that, that are around us in, in the way that they need to be appreciated. Um, and, and I think that a lack of being able to stop long enough to do that, um, has, has harmed the way that we are as people in general. Um, so I, I completely agree that being able to, being able to take a moment just to, just to savor (laughs) you, to use a, a, a food term just to savor the things around you. Uh, a little bit, I think, is is uh, really important. Hey, you know, you, so, t- yeah, you just touched it. on something I didn't think about till just now. I think that that could actually be a small part of what causes that adds to chefs and cooks being burnt out because there are so many times where you're on the line, it's busy, you're not getting a break, so you just slap some kind of random sandwich together or go eat it over a trash can. Mm-hmm. While you're making all of these like gorgeous meals and stuff for people and it you start to like lose the the feelings that you might get or the things that you might experience that somebody else would experience where they got to sit down and take the time to really enjoy their meal, have good company, you know, good conversation mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And right. since we were talking about flavors, I did one. Of, this is an this is a really good book. It's called The yeah. Flavor Bible. This has nice. pretty much every single flavor combination, and it goes into detail about all of that kind of stuff. So if anybody is listening, you don't have to be a cook or a chef to appreciate this because it'll just it'll definitely up your game. Don't worry, I'm not getting huh. sponsored or paid from by them or anything. It's just a really good book that I love, and I just wanted to share that. That's awesome. Yeah, now I'm going to have to go get a copy because mm. I'm, I'm still looking for those sparks and colorful waves. Uh, when I'm, when I'm combining foods, I just, I just can't seem to find it, Jason. (laughs) Um, so, uh, my, my, my active ingredient in this one actually had more to do with Anton ego. Um, the, so one of the, one of the things that, that listeners on my podcast will notice is that I don't, I don't ever give any sort of a, a rating for the movies that I do. Um, I, I consider myself a movie critic, but I'm but I'm not a modern movie critic because <laughs> everything now has to be quantified where it's, you know, eight out of ten or four out of five stars or, you know, whatever. There has to be some quantity that is put with every kind of a review or anything uh, involving movies. And I, I I don't think that that's a good thing. I don't like it. Um, and I think that, that by doing that, because everything has to be quantified now, that that is, that is what has been so damaging to, to the movie industry in general. In past episodes, I've been super critical of a big critic website, Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. They literally give a percentage value to every movie. And, you know, like in our very first episode... Uh, about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The very first movie has so much meaning to so many people, but you ask Rotten Tomatoes and it is certified rotten, you know? Um, but how can that be when it when there's a whole generation of people who whose heart ached to have that movie and, and remember it so fondly? Um... And and it's because everything has to have a number or a value attached to it now. Um, I mean, think about the old movie reviews, how it would be, you know, this person says that it's a great movie and you should go watch it with your family. You know, Siskel and Ebert gave it two thumbs up and all of that. I mean, that was the most quantity that you had was two thumbs up. Yeah. And some of them were really awful, (laughs) but you know, you got, um, you know, I mean, it, it, there wasn't really anything as far as as far as quantity goes. No, no number attached, nothing like that. And I think I think that's been a big part of the reason why everybody is so hypercritical of movies now. 
you know, there's all these plot holes. <clears throat> well, there weren't actually... plot holes to begin with, you know? Right. Um, so somebody else actually pointed out that they cannot name a single movie that is a big box office movie that wasn't a remake or a right. spinoff of something that already existed. Or a recreation a of... And yeah, I tried. Like, like mm-hmm. I couldn't find it. Remakes um, and sequels. Movies and... Well, I mean, MCU, based on comic books. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's really a whole lot of other things other than that. I mean, there's still some people out there that, that are making some original content and a lot of uh, some of those are even doing things that are based off of their own work. Um, but, uh, but no, you're right. Like the, uh, there's so many reboots now it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but, uh, but no, really, I think, I think that critics need to be, need to be a little bit more careful about how they, about how they push things into, uh, other people's minds. You know, we have a responsibility as critics to make sure that we are not giving people their opinions, that we are giving them our opinions, you know, keeping, keeping that free mind thing. That's what it was for me. And it was all, it was all because of, uh, uh, Anton ego. Um, and actually I have a couple of uh, sound bites that, that kind of brought that up for me. I'm going to play those quick. In many ways, the work of a critic is easy. We risk very little yet enjoy a position over those who offer up their work and their selves to our judgment. We thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating itself. That's very humbling. You know, you're you're put into this place where you where you can you can damage somebody or something with your words. Look at how that can affect uh, the food industry. I mean, have you have you had any struggles with with you know critics and how they work? The biggest problem I've had it isn't with direct critics. The way that some of these critical apps and websites work. The problem is that so many people are so willing to give a bad review, like on Yelp. But not as willing to give a good one. Yeah, it's like for every 15 or 20 bad reviews, there's like one positive one. And, right. you know, it's usually somebody that really took the time to make it. But most mostly it's just people that are, they get mad because this was wrong or that took too long or whatever. And then they just blast. You know, and that's the only the time. Restaurant. And right. that's the only time they want to say anything. I am going to give every listener that is listening right now a prescription. And that prescription is to go out and find somebody that is doing a good job. And make sure to tell them, hey, you do a good job. Now, this can be anybody. Like at the gas station where you pick up your coffee on your way to work. Uh, this can be... You know, the guy that sits in the in the cubicle next to you. This can be the um you know, the the lady that's that's you know wherever. Like I don't care who it is. Somebody who you see is doing something right and doing something well, tell them, Hey, you're doing a good job. Just do that. And uh and don't tell anybody that they're doing a bad job that day. <laughs> that day. <laughs> I mean, you, tomorrow. Maybe, maybe wait a day, but take a day just to tell people that they're doing a good job. Now, if you've got a movie that's been medicine for you and you'd like to be on the show, you can email me at contact at movie uh, or you can leave a voicemail or text me at 402-519-5790. If anxiety has been keeping you from wanting to get on, you can always uh, write me a couple paragraphs and, and uh, about uh, a movie that's really moved you and, I can read it on air. Uh, Remember, this movie is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease, and we'll see you at the next appointment.